Welcome to worship on this Pentecost Sunday as we look back and take stock of the past year during the pandemic and take fresh energy in for the new thing that God is doing. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Our opening verse today is on the theme of hope and it comes from the poet Mary Oliver and she really gets at the crux of the matter, which is that hope requires something of us. We have to enact hope. We can't just wish we need to move the next step into becoming agents for bringing about the hope that we see and feel. And it also expresses what many people are aspiring to as the pandemic recedes. Listen to her words. I want to think again of dangerous and noble things. I want to be light and frolicsome. I want to be improbably beautiful and afraid of nothing, as though I had wings. Please join me for a few moments of quiet as we recall the presence of God in the sounds that we hear all around us in the way that our body and our breath feel. Let us sing our opening song. Will you pray with me? Creator and lover, from whom all life and hope spring forth, we thank you for your gift of the land and waters, the air and skies, 
plants and animals of all sizes and varieties. Long ago, you handed us responsibility for tilling, keeping, caring for earth as stewards of your creation. We assumed they would take care of themselves and serve us, but with our planet in peril, the land and waters warming, the air and skies polluted, and the plants and animals dying, we realize we were mistaken. We hope it's not too late for healing both our bond with the earth, each other, and you. Forgive us and restore us to right relationship with all things, pouring out your spirit anew and bringing wholeness, peace, and humility. Amen. And now as a sign of the healing and the wholeness that we seek, I invite you to pass the peace to those around you. If you're worshiping by yourself, hold in your mind's eye the picture of someone with whom you would like to share peace. With those around you, if you're watching with others, turn to each other in a hug or a kiss or a handshake and say the words, peace be with you. Peace be with you. I want to invite the children and any others to come closer to the screen so we can talk a little bit about how resilient life is in the face of death. Have you ever seen pictures of a town after a tornado has been through? What does it look like? All the houses and cars and clothing and appliances and other things are scattered all over, a mess. Sometimes walls of a house are no longer standing or the roof has been blown miles away from the house that it was sitting on. Or take another example. Think about a forest after a forest fire. Think of the trees charred and smoldering. The ground, maybe black with no plants on it anymore. And what's left of the trees are black and like skeletons, still standing there, but bare, no leaves. And maybe the little branches are all burned off. Well, in our story from the prophet Ezekiel this morning, that's a little bit like what Ezekiel was looking at when he had this dream this vision of a flat plain, almost like a desert, stretching out for miles in all directions, as far as he could see, and scattered over, all over that plain, that desert, were millions of bones, like the town after the tornado, or the forest after the fire, just desolate. And you wonder, can these bones live again? And we also wonder, can that town rebuild again? Or can any plants and trees come back to that forest? But the answer to all of these questions is yes, they can. And they do. You may have seen this. It may take a while, just like a town rebuilding after a tornado. Or the seeds that take root and grow, what are called pioneer trees and other plants that grow low to the ground in a forest as it's coming back from a forest fire. I remember going to Yellowstone National Park over 10 years ago and seeing where a huge wildfire had come through 10 years before that. And it still looked less like a forest and more like a meadow with grass and little plants and maybe a few growing trees, but not much. But eventually forests regrow themselves. And so all of these things to me remind me that we can have hope. The hope that a tornado or a fire or anything else can happen. And in these situations, life returns and this town rebuilds. This forest regrows and people and animals are born and replace those who have died. Life is strong. I want you to always remember that. Will you pray with me? 
God, we thank you that life is tough. Tough and resilient. That death is not the last thing that happens, but instead life continues and is renewed, just like a town after a disaster or a forest after a fire. Help us to have hope in this time when we are finishing the school year and maybe we know people who have been sick. Help us to have hope and help us to comfort them or to be their friend. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Today's reading is from Ezekiel 37, verses 1 through 14. The hand of the Lord is upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O oh Lord, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded and as I prophesied suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones were coming together, bone to bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. And I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. And I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. I want to share a second reading with you, sort of a retelling, um, taking poetic liberties with the Ezekiel story. And particularly um, recalling that question, oh man, can these bones live? Zeke dreadful water, what a name. Zeke Dreadful Water was on a pilgrimage. His journey had begun in southwestern North Carolina, not far from Chattanooga, Tennessee, and would take him all the way to his birthplace outside Tahlequah, Oklahoma. He had grown up in the Indian Territory, so-called, a member of the Eastern Band of the Cherokee. His ancestors had lived in North Georgia before it had been given that name by European settlers. They had hunted the hills and hollers of Middle Tennessee through which he was passing presently. Later, that same landscape would see his people die across each of its many miles as they were removed to the west. The young man driving the 1968 Chevrolet Impala was the namesake of one of the survivors of this trail of tears, Ezekiel Dreadful Water, who was Zeke's great-great-grandfather. His forebear had been a Methodist lay preacher in the Indian territories after the removal, and the old man's Bible had come to Zeke along with his name. Zeke's grandfather used to read to him from it, just as his grandfather had done for him. 
The stories of the children of Israel were so intermingled with the memories of his own people that sometimes it was difficult for Zeke to sort out which story appeared in the Bible and which did not. Not that it mattered much, since Zeke was not religious in any recognizable sense of the word. Neither did he go to church, nor did he follow the old ways. Like every other Cherokee he knew, he saw the sacred nature of almost everything and everyone he encountered. But that was just ordinary life as he knew it, not something he could isolate and call his religion. As he drove through the countryside of Middle Tennessee, a memory kept surfacing that he could not quite put out of his mind. His grandfather had told him that his own grandfather had told of the many people who died along the trail of the removal. It always reminded the old preacher of the story in Ezekiel about the valley filled with dry bones. When he arrived in the Indian territories, he kept asking himself and God the question, can these bones live? Did he ever answer the question, Zeke would ask his grandfather? You are the answer, my child, was his grandfather's reply, and I am the answer. We live, the people live, as long as we remember. Well, Zeke remembered all right, but he wasn't sure that what he pieced together of his family and tribal history was really an answer. The people didn't seem to be doing so well recently, if ever they had. After the war between the states, the federal government would use the Native Americans' alliance with the Confederacy as justification for breaking treaties and taking what they wanted once again. Each mile he drove became an endurance test, since he knew he was driving over the bones of his ancestors, the dry, dead bones of his past. Could these bones live? Not likely. He was not even sure what had drawn him to this grim pilgrimage, an old story told in an old book owned by an old man. What was it? Was that it? Was that the reason he found himself here rushing across sacred ground, throwing away the stealth of his hunter ancestors? As he accelerated, pushing his V8 past the legal speed limit, he could not escape the voices. His own voice blended with those of his ancestors, and perhaps the great mystery too. Brother of earth, will these bones live? Here ends the reading. As we celebrate Pentecost this year, it's different somehow. Because of the pandemic, George Floyd's killing, and all that's changed as a result, we've become more aware of how imperiled our earth is in the face of climate change, how precarious our relationships are with the living, and how much closer to death we may feel in the midst of the multiple threats of disease, climate disaster, and white nationalist domestic terrorism. So it seems almost trivial to read the Pentecost story from Acts again this year and simply say, isn't the church great? Wow, the Holy Spirit. Because that's, what, that, that, that's why we're reading Ezekiel in the Valley of the Dry Bones today. Because I think that we need to hear that no matter how far down the scale we've gone, Resurrection is never very far away. It reminds us that Pentecost is not just the story of some inexplicable event that happened long ago in a time and a culture very different from ours and which is pretty hard to believe would happen now and here. Because I think that even though Pentecost and the dry bones tell of supernatural things, they might be more important to us because they remind us that God is ever-present. And when we truly respond to God, the result is powerful, even miraculous, whether it's in sharing the good news of God's unconditional love or climate and creation care that ensure clean water or litter-free land or offering hospitality to someone or group we don't know or being part of a coalition to change legislation or trying once again to have a civil conversation with that neighbor or relative who doesn't exactly share our political views. 
The wonderful thing about the retelling of the Ezekiel, Ezekiel story in the second reading, Zeke dreadful water, is that it reminds us that when we really try to answer the question, can these bones live? We are recognizing that dead and dry bones are everywhere. And yet, they are not the last word on what lies ahead. Ezekiel's vision came at a time when the young Israelite nation was in exile in Babylon, having been captured by a powerful empire that had destroyed their temple and their holy city, Jerusalem. So as often happens when people relocate, the Israelites made the best of it. They tried to make Babylon as comfortable as they could while they were there. The people were allowed to build homes, raise crops, and even conduct commerce. Some of them even became rich in the midst of their life there. They raised families. They were allowed to assemble in groups, elect leaders, and even worship. But it was an imperfect setting. They were strangers in a strange land. And if you're estranged long enough, you forget how to sing God's song, the song of Zion in that land that is not yours. And that forgetting can sometimes harden into refusing. One of the things I've noticed in my work over the years is that when people experience a great tragedy in their lives, like a death in the family or a divorce or the loss of a job or a farm or their sense of security, one of the first signs something is wrong is they go missing from community, like worship. It's as though their grief or their embarrassment at the loss in their lives makes them want to sever ties to the worshiping community. It's ironic, but at the very time when we most need community with others in connection with the holy, we find it hardest to find our way to these things. The same is true in the ways we may isolate ourselves inside, disconnecting from our bodies and from nature. We decide to commune with the dead rather than with life and hope. The story of Ezekiel's vision may be familiar to us, but there's an oddity to it. I mean, here's a priest prophet who finds himself standing in a mass grave among thousands and thousands of skeletons. Ezekiel has had visions before. It was the main way in which God communicated with him through visions and symbols. But this surpassed anything he had seen or experienced ever. Here he was, a priest bound by Jewish ritual purity laws, not to even be in the same room with a corpse, not even allowed to attend a funeral unless it was for a family member. And here he was being led into a valley full of dry, dead bones. Talk about communing with the dead. And yet, this is what God does in the name of redemption. It goes where renewal is most needed, in the most direct way possible, to meet the need. And what is the need here in the valley but new life? Here in the valley of dry bones, without a scrap of flesh left on them, among a thousand skeletons, completely disjointed, bones scattered about, dried up, and long ago dead, without a bit of life left in them, the most desolate of surroundings. Here, God tells Ezekiel to prophesy to the bones, to the dead. Here are bones that need a word spoken to them, the word that carries the spirit of God to them, buried under all of the coping mechanisms the Israelites have piled on top of them over the centuries or the decades, all in an attempt to make life livable in the midst of tragedy, and yet which have rendered their life lifeless. Lifelessness is what I remember looking out on after the protests and theft and fire and destruction after George Floyd was killed on Memorial Day last year. They resulted in curfews and boarded up windows and doors and fear and silence. Larpenter Avenue was as vacant and silent as a tomb, and parking lots normally full at the stores were empty. Lifelessness is what some of our closest relationships felt like during the worst of the pandemic, when we couldn't get too close to one another, or trust that we or that other person wasn't carrying the virus, sometimes separated by not being able to visit family. Lifelessness is what it felt like to essential workers who lost their jobs, or whose jobs in the case of frontline workers became so indispensable that there weren't enough hours in the day and their job became a life and death proposition. Truly, we can say that we were looking out on a desolate valley, 
maybe not of dry bones, but of bare bones life, stripped to essentials and survival, to turning in upon ourselves and clutching tightly to what we had for fear of losing it. We understand, Zeke. We understand. We feel your pain. What word are you and I being asked to speak into the valley of death we are looking out on? What good word or action is the Spirit asking, even demanding of us, if we had but eyes and ears to see and hear? And what would happen if we answered the call and spoke or did it? God tells Ezekiel to prophesy to the bones, to what is dead. And lo and behold, the bones begin to rattle and begin to connect again, to find each other and fit together once again. And it says sinews appeared, ligaments and tendons, reassembling the scattered bones into whole frames again. A miracle in itself. And yet this rattling to life and reconnecting and reassembling is but the beginning of what is to come. When life appears out of the death we have been communing with, more life and more wholeness are demanded. God is not only about dragging skeletons out of closets, much less off the dry desert floor of that valley. Dragging skeletons out of closets is therapy, but this is redemption. For as Ezekiel says, there was as yet no breath in them. The bones themselves, even the sinews and flesh and skin covering them, cannot yet stand because there is no breath, no spirit in them. They are not living yet. The work of redemption is more than merely reassembling the pieces of our lives, more than cleaning up our rivers and air, more than picking up litter or recycling or composting. It is redeeming our broken relationship with God, others, and the creation. It's moving from out of step and out of balance with everything and restoring alignment, balance, and even discovering synchronicity, the way the cosmos and our lives coordinate in surprising and purposeful ways. You see, when God comes to what is dead, the dead who have lost their spirit, their very essence, their very hope, the spirit needs to be breathed into them once again. The same spirit that brooded over the face of the deep at creation and brought forth life out of nothing. And God says, prophesy to the breath, O mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. And he does. And they do live. And they stand on their feet, a vast multitude. And only then do we hear what this vision means. The bones are the house of Israel, the people with no hope, who are clean cut off from God. These bones are us. Where are we still dead? Where are we still desolate? Where is it in our life together that we have become comfortable yet still lack life? Of course, as I look back on how far we've come since the pandemic began 14 months ago, it warms my heart to see people smiling, caring, renewing the physicality of our relationships while still respecting each other's boundaries. I mean, last Sunday was something really to behold. God sees it and says that it is very good. And yet, are we standing on our own? Do we ever really stand on our own? Or is this Pentecost inviting us into a deeper relationship with the breath, a deeper grounding in the spirit, trusting and relying on God and the sacred for our very essence, our very life? And is there a greater calling to a deeper wholeness, a more durable, abiding presence than we've ever experienced? I'm reading a novel called Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel about the world after civilization collapsed during a pandemic and destroyed electricity, running water and sanitation, the internet, transportation, and everything we take for granted. And there's this small band of 20 or so actors, artists, and musicians called the Traveling Symphony who travel up and down the shores of the Great Lakes region in the post-apocalyptic landscape of the former United States performing Shakespeare and playing music, bringing the arts, beauty, and renewal to the flagging spirits of the small number of people who are left on Earth. And one of the performers has a quote from Star Trek Voyager tattooed on her forearm that says, because survival is insufficient, could be the answer to the question about why Pentecost. Survival is insufficient. Survival is always a necessary start, 
but always insufficient. Those bones of Ezekiel's vision once they were standing and had God's spirit animating them couldn't stay in that desolate valley forever. Brought back to life they were, but for what? It's time to move out of the valley into what this Pentecost, this pouring out of the spirit is calling us to do. Time to stop communing with the dead. Time to live the life of the redeemed and the redemptive in great joy and courage in the time ahead. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal Spirit of the universe, we thank you that you do not leave us alone, but place the fire of your word within us and enable the winds of life to flow through our life together. You are no statue made of gold or silver or stone, but a living, breathing reality in the face of the earth and within the human heart. Give us courage and commitment to let your winds blow through us and to let your life be revealed among us. Empowered by your spirit, may we care for the needs of your earth and its people, embrace and eventually break bread together again in joy and praise you day by day. Grant us your peace as we lift up our prayers of joy and concern for ourselves and others and all creation now in the quiet stillness of our hearts. God, thank you for hearing our prayers even before we utter them. And we offer all of them in the name of the one with whom we are bold to pray. Eternal spirit, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and that shall be, mother and father of us all, loving God in whom is heaven. The hallowing of your name echo through the universe. May the way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us, for you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. I have a couple of announcements. We have two staff searches going on this summer. They're about to begin. More info is coming in the tab, newsletter, and in worship announcements. If you are interested in being considered for the search team for either position, 
either for a part-time faith formation specialist, somebody um, do, who does a ministry uh, with church, um, uh, children, youth, and families, um, or uh, a new director of music, um, please contact the team leads, Mar Fabianski for music and Mark Miazga for faith formation. And please keep both searches in your prayers because we are preparing to step up in a big way with these new commitments that will help us fulfill our mission more completely as a truly intergenerational singing congregation. Very exciting, but also uh, a very uh, demanding summer that we have ahead of us. So we covet your prayers and your participation. And the second is that Holy Hammers Week for our church with Habitat for Humanity is July 19 through 23. And I invite you to sign up to work one of those days at the Roseville site. More information is in the tab, including a link to donate to this year's Holy Hammers offering by next Sunday's deadline of May 30th. Our commitment to build to the build this year is $3,000. Help us make that uh, fulfill that commitment. Um, we are given much in the work of the Holy Spirit, in our work, as a, in our work, in our play, and in our life together as a church. And part of what we do at this time in every worship service, whether it's online or in person, is we give financially, but we also bring to God all that God is doing through us. And we offer our lives, um, our prayers, our actions, our social justice witness, our loving spirit that welcomes all extravagantly. All of this is what we call our gifts and our gratitude, which we offer to God during this time in the service, as well as offering the music that plays in our offertory. So thank you for being generous. Thank you for your life that is part of our life together. Oh, no. 
Let us pray. Loving God, the breath and wind of your spirit transforms us and rearranges our priorities and our lives as it brings life out of death. May these gifts emerge from quiet reflection and from placing our lives in your care and purpose so that they become signs of your love made real in Christ, living within and among us. Amen.